This video will show you why to learn Eurocham Cambodia. What is Eurocham? Eurocham is the European Chamber of Commerce and the leading foreign business association in Cambodia. Eurocham's core activities are promoting, supporting, and representing its members and sustainable business interests in Cambodia. Since 2011, Eurocham has grown to over 300 members and six national chapters. Joining Eurocham can help you to grow your business in the kingdom. Who can join? Eurocham is open to everybody, locals and foreigners, companies, small and large, and individuals are all eligible to become Eurocham members. We are looking for new startups or small and medium-sized enterprises that are looking to grow. Why join Eurocham? Eurocham provides unique opportunities and events that help you network with like-minded people and organizations. Becoming a Eurocham member will help build the visibility of your business both here in Cambodia as well as regionally and internationally. By joining us, you are giving yourself a bigger, louder voice, a voice that can be heard further away than ever before. Eurocham membership helps you to grow your network, have a voice in shaping policies, take advantage of training, increase your company's visibility, build the right team, your Cham represents opportunity. Opportunity to build, to grow, to expand, and develop. Visit our website today and become a Your Cham member. Did you know that small and medium-sized enterprises represent 99% of all businesses in the EU and account for 70% of all jobs? Close to 45% of GDP in the EU was generated by IPR-intensive industries. SMEs are the motor of the EU economy. Their potential to boost employment and drive future innovation, two key priorities for the European Union, should not be overlooked. SMEs are particularly present in innovative industries such as clean technologies, healthcare, ICT, etc. Today, more and more SMEs are looking for business opportunities in emerging markets. Many of those companies are considering China, Southeast Asia and Latin America as potential destinations. Trade relations between the EU and emerging markets have taken a new turn with the ongoing negotiation of FTAs and investment agreements. These regions are attractive destinations for European investors with their fast-growing markets, rising middle classes and competitiveness. Due to limited resources and available capacity, SMEs face many difficulties in managing their IP assets, and particularly when this involves IPR infringement in other regions. Intangible assets such as intellectual property rights are key factors in the competitiveness of businesses in the global economy. We have to be aware that IPR-intensive industries contributed 86% of imports and 93% of exports to EU external trade. And in developing markets such as Southeast Asia, Latin American countries and China, your trademark, patent, trade secret, industrial design are endangered. Before internationalizing your business, take an active part in protecting your assets. The International IPR SME Help Desks are here to assist you and contribute to SME's internationalization by the provision of step-by-step -step advice to build a successful IPR strategy for entering into the Chinese, Southeast Asian and or Latin American markets. The range of services offered by the Help Desk includes a 24-hour helpline service to reply to IPR questions, free online and on-site trainings delivered by IPR experts, free publications on various IPR topics and country fact sheets, and other useful information forms such as case studies, e-learning modules, video podcasts and more. So if you have any inquiries on IP protection, 
Contact the help desk in China, SEA or Latin America to learn how to manage your IP assets and expand your business successfully. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good afternoon, Excellency, friends, partners, members of Eurocham Cambodia. A very good afternoon. I am Tika and I will be your host this afternoon. In this webinar, we will be covering three main points, which is introductions, a presentations by Mr. David Haskell, and a QA sessions. So um, if you have any questions, please drop the questions in the chat box. And if you have and if you have any comments, please drop the comments in the chat box. And if you have any questions, please drop the question in the Q&A box. Our panelists and facilitator will have you on that. So we would like to um, thanks to our annual partner for their ongoing support to Eurochem, as far as we know. And also, right now, we would like to invite His Excellency Sudhichir, Director of the Department of Intellectual Property from the Ministry of Commerce to, opening, to have his opening remark. Please welcome. So uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say uh, hello to Mr. Dennis uh, Sante Mary, Security Director of uh, Eurocharm, Mr. Narat Chiu, Eurocharm Board Member, Chairman of Eurocharm, HR Committee and Managing Director, uh, Mr. David Haskell, uh, Mr. Harrison Wai, Mr. Solatang, uh, lady and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of Excellency Pan Sosa, Minister of Commerce uh, and the Chairman of National Committee for Intellectual Property, I have the honor and pleasure to deliver an opening remark for Eurocharm webinar on freelancing and consultancy. What about intellectual property right? And I also take the opportunity to express our appreciation to Eurocharm that is a good partner for us, a private sector that to work closely with um, DIP, Ministry of Commerce, that, uh, to promote the awareness uh, of intellectual property, especially um, uh, to encourage uh, uh, the business from uh, Eurocharm to, uh, uh, with Ministry of Commerce, with other for the uh, proposal of development of business. So uh, today I'm very happy uh, to join and can see the participants online. That is a good sign that uh, uh, our people, our private sector are more interesting to know about to learn intellectual property. We know that intellectual property is the creation of mind that create trademark and copyright and pattern. So the good around us, the third that we are uh, wearing and the laptop that we are using uh, are the consumption good, both industrial good and agriculture good, uh, ranking from uh, automobile and other, that is come from uh, intellectual property. So uh, this is, uh, they have uh, the uh, stakeholder, we can see that in uh, private sector, business, SME, a small and medium enterprise, like I, and know that about your video clip that uh, SME play a key role in uh, European and Cambodian also SME play a key role in economic Cambodian and create a job. So that uh, why uh, we would like to encourage SME to utilize intellectual property for their product development. So uh, that why in the government institution, uh, we have a National Committee for Intellectual Property Right, that Ministry of Commerce, uh, Excellency Pan Sosa, as uh, Chairman of the National Committee for Intellectual Property. And we have 17 members from other in interior ministry. And I myself uh, is a, a head of secretary of National Committee for Intellectual Property Right. So the, the, you may know that uh, trademark is under the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, Pattern under MISTI, copyright is under of uh, Ministry of Culture and Finance, and in which we have uh, uh, law, uh, law on trademark uh, uh, concerning mark trade name and act on fair competition adopted in 2002. We have law on pattern utility model. Uh, and industrial design adopted in 2003. We have law on 
copyright and related right adopted in 2003. We have law on seed management and uh, breeder right adopted in 2008. We have law on geographical indication uh, that adopted in uh, 2013. And now we are drafting the trade secret law uh, and und undisclosed information. And we join a member of uh, WIPO since 1995 and we are comply with uh, uh, Paris, uh, we are a member of Paris Convention and we implement our three trade related aspects on intellectual property. Also, we are a member of um, Patent Cooperation Treaty and uh, Matrix Protocol of International Trademark Registration. So, this is the guideline that uh, we provide to promote intellectual property uh, in Cam Cambodia. And at the same time, uh, we are drafting the IP policy to promote uh, technology, to promote uh, branding or trademark innovation uh, for the sector of uh, agriculture, industry, commerce, um, uh, culture, tourism, and uh, uh, technology and science. That is uh, what the way. So uh, this is a very, uh, I can say that is very important webinar that you uh, raise the topic of uh, freelancing and consultancy of intellectual property. As we know that, uh, as we mentioned that the role of SME play an important role. Cambodian uh, about 50,000, uh, 50, including small and medium enterprise, in which micro is uh, counted about 99%. Uh, but less than 1% is like company. And we can see that less uh, uh, company that are tied with intellectual property. So it is important to uh, uh, disseminate understanding about the employer and employee because uh, we can see that among SME, they have uh, uh, in their the structure, they have employee and employee for for create the intellectual property, create a product. And sometimes freelancing that uh, work uh, with the uh, employer to create intellectual property. So freelancing should understand the existing intellectual property that I uh, mentioned before. Uh, for example, the trademark law. Uh, freelancing can register trademark. In, in Cambodian, in trademark law, it first to file. Uh, even individual can register, but after uh, Five years, you have to declare about a fee bit of non use, uh, and then a renewal of the 10 years, the protection uh, and uh, the right of protection, the right confer, the help the, uh, uh, the owner of the registered trademark can uh, uh, oppose again any uh, counterfeited good, uh, file to the court again any unuseful that good, and they have the right offer for sale. Uh, and uh, licensing and franchising, something like that. You have to freelance, uh, freelancing, you need to understand about the uh, patent law. In Cambodian, uh, patent, uh, we register patent for any invention that, uh, that uh, uh, if they comply with new inventive stuff and uh, uh, industry applicable and uh, the protection after 20 years and uh, a patent that cannot registerable if any if, uh, if plant, patient, animal, or any uh, mathematics like that. And uh, for the inventor, uh, if freelancer that invent um, the invention, they can register, apply for patent. If they can uh, get a, pa a patent, it means they have the right to offer for sale, to give license franchise to uh, the employer, to the other. So, but if they work under the uh, labor contract, under employment, so the right of uh, uh, patent is uh, belong to uh, the employer. So you need to have a, a, a contract. But if you own registered by your own, if freelancing registered by the own, of course, uh, you have the, uh, the ownership on that the registered patent and the way yet through licensing and franchising to to uh, to the company to, or to the employer and copyright also uh, uh, we have uh, the right of work if you uh, uh, create a right it work and literary work music work uh, picture painting uh, like that you have the right the right for selling reproducing uh, reprinting something like that they have economic right and uh, uh, moral right so uh, the order have 
moral right they have to put the name of the author if freelancing that you invention or you create a work for example you write a book or music uh, painting like that moral right is the right to put the name of freelancer you cannot uh, eliminate but economic right if you work under the employment contract economic right it belong to the employer that uh, the right of uh, reproduction the right of uh, uh, printing the right of uh, renting like that inventor for invention as well if you freelancer invent new technology you have the right and the name of the inventor have to put up on invention but if for under the labor contract the right of opportunity belong to uh, employer so uh, this is uh, the law existing law that uh, you should understand uh, in order to protect uh, your business. Okay, uh, one again, I thank you for uh, inviting me to join this important and uh, we hope that we can work together between uh, Eurocharm and uh, Department of Intellectual Property and other Secretariat or National Committee for Intellectual Property to promote the business in Cambodian. And I wish uh, uh, this uh, workshop is successful and uh, uh, I would like to declare to open this uh, uh, seminar and wish you all best wish. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency, for your very insightful remarks. So next, we will have Mr. David Haskell, external expert of Southeast Asia IP SME Help Desk and partner of Abacus IP. We'll be giving the presentations about the role of IP in freelancing and consultancy. Please welcome. David, uh, you are still muted. Sorry. Uh, uh, Dennis, uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, David, I'm sorry. Could I leave now? Because now I'm in Kampot province. I have to back to Phnom Penh now. Uh, yes. Thank you, Your Excellency. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, see you. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me again. Um, so, thank you all for joining on this webinar on the role of intellectual property in the for freelance and consulting sector in Cambodia. Um, as <clears throat> was mentioned, I'm uh, a partner at Abacus IP, which is a um, full service intellectual property consultancy. I'm originally from California, but have been working in this field for over a decade of just um, intellectual property in Cambodia. Now, before we get started, just a, a short word about the IP, Southeast Asia IP SME Help Desk. Um, they have an inquiry helpline. All of these services are free, so you can write an email or call them with your questions about intellectual property. They do webinars and e-learning modules such as today. Um, they have a very good website and blog and newsletter. They do in-person training workshops and have a whole range of guides on um, industry-specific IP issues, country-specific, and so forth. Um, so this is a very good resource with all of the URLs here at the bottom if you want to learn more. The motivation for today's this webinar is why is this relevant to you? Um, so intellectual property is central to a knowledge economy. And as Cambodia develops from an agricultural and manufacturing-based economy, intellectual property is just going to become more and more important. You've probably seen some of it in your daily life, and I hope that this webinar will um, increase your knowledge and interest in this field. I would argue that most or perhaps even all of what a freelancer or consultant does involves in some way intellectual property. Um, you'll see a number of examples of that today, um, but there's, there's not much that a freelancer or consultant can do that doesn't somehow involve IP. It's important for the freelancers and consultants themselves to understand these issues, and also for the companies that hire them, for the individuals that hire them. IP is everywhere, and it's often hidden in plain sight. Even if you have never heard the term, you've definitely come in contact with it. So I don't uh, presume any prior knowledge of intellectual property. We're gonna start with um, some of the basics, 
and go into depth there. And um, at, by the end of it, I hope you have a general sense of the issues and can spot these issues in your, your daily work and know where to go for further information and to, to actualize these, these matters. So first we're gonna start with just what is intellectual property? The basics of copyrights, who is a freelancer or consultant, and then the inbound copyright issues and outbound copyright issues. And finally, we'll have a case study and then concluding with uh, the panelists and Q and A's. Um, and if anyone wants, be sure to use the, the chat function in Zoom for Q and A's. So what is intellectual property? It refers to the creations of the mind, such as inventions, uh, literary and artistic works, designs and symbols, names and images used in commerce. Um, as you see, it's the use of such as, it means that this is really just a, an umbrella category of a number of different regimes, of different legal regimes, of copyright, of patent, of trademark, and so forth. Um, a few examples of really valuable IP that you probably know about, Coca-Cola, obviously the name, the words Coca-Cola, you see there's the registered circle, um, but also the colors and the script um, are all registered trademarks. Apple has <clears throat> registered trademark for the word Apple and the iPad, iPod Touch word, as well as the shape of the design and all of the technology that goes into these devices. Harry Potter um, is primarily protected by copyright. So all of the books and the movies that come out of that, but also the name Harry Potter is a tra registered trademark. The Polaroid instant camera, if we go back a number of decades, there's all of the technology that went into there that's protected by patents. And more recently, the process of copying DNA is uh, a very valuable patent. Um, digging a little deeper into the different regimes, we have trademarks, which protects the distinctive identification of products or services. You get it by either using it or registering it. Uh, in Cambodia, it's primarily through registration. You have very little rights if you do not register your trademark. Um, so if you start a business and you are using your brand and someone comes along and registers it, you have a big problem. Industrial designs protects the external appearance of a product. So the uh, shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, very distinctive shape, is protected as an industrial design and needs to be registered. Trade secrets, His Excellency mentioned that there is a draft law um, being formulated at present. So Cambodia does not have a, a full trade secret regime, but there's protection in other laws. Um, what it does is protects valuable information that's not known to the public and you have to take reasonable efforts to keep it secret. Moving on, patents and utility models are uh, very similar. They both protect new inventions and you have to apply for it and the registrar will examine um, whether you meet the criteria for protection. Uh, utility models is essentially like a baby patent. So it's easier to get, uh, but it's a very shorter term. And finally, most importantly for this presentation is copyright uh, because this is the uh, primary issue that uh, freelancers and consultants will face. Of unless of course they're being hired to invent something, then patents come into play, but that's mostly not the case. We're really going to be spending the time today on copyright issues, which protect original, creative, or artistic forms, and they exist automatically. So unlike a patent, you do not need to register your copyright. The moment that you write it or you take that picture, it's protected. So it protects any production of the human mind, such as literary and artistic works. And it has to be the expression and not the mere idea. So if you think about the Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling does not have exclusive ownership of the idea of a little boy who does magic, um, but she has protection for the expression of that idea in the books and the movies that came out of it. So someone else can write a book about a boy who uh, does magic, but could not copy those books. And it confers legal protection um, for a limited period of time. Limited period of time is actually very long. It's in most cases uh, 50 years after you die. So it's not something you need to worry about, probably for your grandchildren. This is what copyright, the Cambodian copyright law uh, protects. These um, 
numerous categories in Article 7. Some of them are very specific. So uh, E, circus performance and pantomimes, or J, architectural works. But some of them are very, very broad. So the first one is all kinds of reading books or other literary, artistic, scientific, and educational documents, which arguably protects any kind of text from your SMS to your emails and everything in between, a text and, and mixture of texts and, and drawings or photographs. Um, under I, you have photographic works, so every kind of uh, photograph from a selfie um, to uh, this video recording of the Zoom would be protected as a, under G as an audiovisual work. Um, so it's very, very broad. <clears throat> the scope of the protection. You start with economic rights. So as Excellency mentioned this, they relate to the economic exploitation of the work. This is what prevents someone from making uh, a counterfeit, a copy of it. It also protects against making derivative work. So taking one work and, and doing a, a mashup or some kind of modification of it. It also prevents the performance of a work. So uh, showing a movie in a movie theater would be an ex economic exploitation. These are freely transferable. So you can sell the right to someone else or give it away. And then they own that right outright, or you can send, you can have a license for it, which is permission. Um, so you retain the copyright, you retain the economic rights, but you give someone permission to use it in perhaps cer certain ways with certain restrictions. We'll speak a little bit more about that further. And separately from the economic rights are the moral rights. And this relates to the moral rights of the author themselves. And those are three. There's the right to be identified with the work, to have your name, placed on the work. Um, there's the right to control how it is presented or divulged to the public. And there's protection against your work uh, being used in a disparaging or insulting manner. Um, and these are always retained by the author. You cannot transfer these, you cannot license them, you cannot waive them. The moral rights um, exist in perpetuity for the author of the work and their heirs. There are of course exceptions and limitations listed in the law. The main ones you might think about are personal use. Um, so if you're using a work, uh, making a copy just for your personal use, you're not making any money off of it, that's fine. Uh, also nonprofit educational uh, uses have limitations. <clears throat> Um, and then finally, there's the infringement issue. So if someone uses a work, makes a work that's substantially similar to the copyrighted work, um, that would be infringing. And then remedies are basically what the copyright owner um, can get. So in terms of damages, and you can also have criminal fines and even go to jail, um, criminal, criminal penalties if uh, the infringement is, is extremely egregious. Moving on to who is a freelancer or consultant. Um, on the left, employees. This is the Cambodian labor uh, law. Um, defines employees as someone who receives a wage or a salary, who performs some sort of work, and is under the direction and supervision of the employer. And in contrast to that, our, the labor law uses the term labor contractors doesn't use the term freelancers or consultants, but freelancers or consultants would be considered labor contractors. They receive a fee, so not a, a wage or a salary. They have to do a specific service, um, which should be uh, in the uh, labor contract. Say you need to do X, Y, Z, whereas an employee is you're hired and then your boss tells you, gives you projects and work uh, from time to time. And the labor contract is not under the direct supervision uh, of the person who has hired them. In terms of intellectual property, the uh, IP that an employee creates in the scope of their work, the IP belongs to the employer. Whereas for labor contractors, it's more complicated. And this is what we're going to get into for the rest of the time. Um, the copyright law makes a distinction between the author of a work and the owner of the copyright. So under Article 16, 
the author of the work is the first holder of the, of the rights. In the case of a work created by an author, uh, who's their employer, so if you're, you've been hired, you have an employment contract, um, then the economic rights in that work are transferred to the employer. But the moral rights remain with the, uh, the employee. <clears throat> now, if you are a freelancer or a contractor, or even just in your personal life or as an employee, you might be creating some sort of work uh, could be computer program, could be a text, whatever. And you might be using other people's copyrighted material in your work. So it could be you're taking a snippet of code, computer code that you need to uh, integrate into your program. You might be uh, using some stock images from a website in your uh, PowerPoint presentation, or you might be wanting to copy some text into your uh, your report. And this is all issues about inbound copyright into what you are creating. The questions you ask is who owns that copyright? <clears throat> now, sometimes it's very easy to identify if the article had a, an author's name on it, then they would presumably be the owner of the copyright. Um, oftentimes in the upper right, you see this circle C uh, symbol, um, which is often followed by, in best practice, you should put the author's name after it. And so there you know who owns the copyright. But sometimes you can't identify the copy owner, right owner. But there is, if that has been created, there is someone behind it, even if you can't figure it out uh, at the first step. And the second thing to ask them yourselves is, do you have their permission? So you might have asked them directly, can I use this for this purpose? And they write back, yes. Then you have their permission. Uh, or you might be, that stock image might be on a website that has certain terms and conditions for how you can use the work. Um, there's Creative common licenses uh, that basically give anyone who wants to use it permission to use it under certain terms. Uh, in that case, you have the permission. But otherwise, uh, you don't. Um, the default is you do not have the copyrights owner's permission. <clears throat> Third question is, do you need to attribute? Meaning, do you need to put their name on it? Remembering the moral rights uh, remain with the, uh, the author forever. Um, so if you're using someone else's work, you should put their name, the source of where it came from. And then let's say you don't have their permission, but uh, you want to use it anyway. And here is where the limitations or the exceptions or the the concept of a fair use defense comes into play. Now, one of those defenses is you can, one of the limitations is you can use small uh, citations um, of, uh, let's say, a longer uh, text. Um, so you can cite, uh, but you need to, without quotations, and then you need to obviously identify where it came from. Um, the best practice is to basically clear the copyright, ask yourself these questions, figure out the copyright while you're creating your work rather than going back after the, it's all done and trying to remember where you got that image or who owned that copyright and trying to figure it out after the whole thing is done. Because let's say you can't clear that, <clears throat> that piece of uh, art that you wanted to use and then you have to redo your entire project. <clears throat> if you do not, as a freelancer or a consultant have the permission or uh, you do not have a valid defense, you could be personally liable for the copyright infringement um, by the copyright owner, could come after you. And the liability for the party that has hired you. So they have, say, hired you to write a report. Uh, you provide the report, but it's infringing someone else's copyright. It's not just you who are personally liable, but the, uh, the party that has hired you, uh, presumably they will be making copies and distributing this around. So they, their actions could also create liability um, for themselves. And of course, that uh, all would also increase the risk that your work is rejected and you're not paid. Um, if they um, find that you uh, are infringing copyright, uh, I, as someone who was hired a freelancer, I would reject that work not pay you. 
So that's all about inbound copyright. Outbound copyright is the question of who owns the copyright in the work that the freelancer or the consultant has created, right? Um, if there is no written agreement or if there's a written agreement, but there's no relevant clause dealing with intellectual property, then the default rule according to the Cambodian copyright law is that the freelancer or the consultant is the author and therefore owns the rights. Second point is that the hiring party arguably has a non-exclusive license to use that work. Um, but then the freelancer, because they retain the copyright, can still use that work elsewhere. So maybe on a future project or selling it on to someone else. Um, so <clears throat> I strongly recommend that you write in the uh, consulting or freelance agreement who owns the copyrights in these works. Um, sometimes the freelancer wants to retain it. Sometimes it's very important that the hiring party has full ownership, but this really needs to be clarified before you start working on the project. Um, and this can be done either through assignment, which means transferring of the ownership, or through a license, through giving permission, but then the freelancer consultant still owns the, the copyright. And this can only deal with the economic rights. Those can be assigned and licensed. The moral rights will always stay with the author. Considering a license, you have it can either be exclusive or non-exclusive. Exclusive means that uh, the freelancer will not license it to anyone else. That the uh, person who's hired them uh, has the exclusivity to use that work and no one else can. Or it can be non-exclusive or there can be uh, anything in between. Um, so, you know, you can say it's exclusive to me in this industry, but you can uh, you can license it to someone outside of my industry or outside of Cambodia. The license should also discuss modifications of the work, so derivative works, whether um, the hiring party has permission to adjust the work, modify it, reuse it, and then the scope of the work. So what can they actually do with it? Is it just limited to Cambodia? Um, can they, uh, license it to anyone else, and so forth. So just a few issues that uh, would need to be considered in this written agreement. Next, I hope to actualize these issues with a short case study of, imagine a freelance photographer. Now that's you, and you are in need of a photographer to take some pictures for an event that your company is putting on. So you get on the phone and you call up a photographer. She agrees to uh, take on the project um, and goes to your event and takes this nice picture. Uh, she sends it to you. And then afterwards you send it to this website salon uh, along with little text about your event and they publish it for you. Um, very common situation. What IP issues does this raise? Can you use the photographs? What for? Can you modify it? Can you license it? Can you give others permission to use it? Can the photographer prevent you from using them? Can the photographer demand attribution that their name appears under the photograph? Can the news site publish the photograph? Let's dive deeper into these questions. What was going on in this discussion from a legal perspective? So, you called up the photographer, she agreed to do the project. Um, you have a verbal contract. There is nothing ever signed. The terms of this agreement are pretty unclear, uh, but it's generally that uh, you will pay her, she will do some photography, but then there was no discussion of intellectual property. This happens all the time. Then she goes and takes the picture. The copyright is, <clears throat> owned by the author as the original owner, both the economic rights and the moral rights. And then the website who has made a reproduction of the work, a copy, um, would be infringing unless it's authorized by the copyright owner or they have a valid defense. So let's dig into this a little further. Who owns the copyright? Article two says the author means a person who created a work, 
Article 16, the author of the work is the first holder of both the moral and the economic rights. And Article 18, the author of a work shall enjoy an exclusive right on that work, which shall be enforceable against all persons. Which means, you put that together, the original owner of the copyright is the photographer. She pressed the button on the camera. <clears throat> now, what did you get out of this? Um, was there a transfer of the copyright? Article 35 makes very clear that if you're transferring the, uh, the exploitation of the author's rights, it has to be in writing. And there was nothing in writing. Therefore, there's no way for you to have uh, gotten the copyright from that verbal contract. But did you get a license? Well, there's also, there was no discussion of that. There was nothing in writing. Um, you just have the verbal agreement. Can you imply a license by the nature of the deal? I mean, what were you trying to buy from her when you talked about it and you said, okay, come take the photograph. Uh, what is the scope of that license? If you imply a license, is it exclusive? Are you the only one who can use that picture or can she turn around and license it to other people? Article 34 deals with this. And it says that the contracts of the exploitation of economic rights must also be stated in writing. Otherwise, this contract will be considered as null and void. And this article, I think, is, is quite problematic for this, um, this case study because it, it, it's arguable what, whether this agreement was for the exploitation of those economic rights. Um, because you, <clears throat> as the hiring party, uh, were you trying to ex exploit those rights or did you just want the rights to be created in the first place? And unfortunately, there's no uh, further definition of this in the law or the regulations or jurisprudence on this. So it can really become a, a point of disagreement between the parties about, <clears throat> did you get a license? Um, do you have the right to exploit those economic rights? And if not, then it's null and void and the, the contract is completely off, which really goes against the intent of the parties, right? She, uh, she wanted to get the money, <clears throat> he wanted the photograph and the copyright law comes and complicates all of this. Now, completely separate from that is the moral rights. So even if there was a license implied for the economic rights, the photographer still has the moral rights, the, man, the right to decide on the manner and timing of the disclosure, the right to have her name on it, uh, and she can oppose the distortion, mutilation, or modification of the right. Um, so <clears throat> when the, the disclosure happened, probably first on that website, um, she was not aware of that. So this would have violated her moral rights. And if it didn't have her name on it, then it's also violating her moral right to attribution. The new site, again, it reproduced the photograph. Um, the photographer still owns the copyright. Um, the hiring party, you, does not have the right to sublicense it. And the photographer still has those moral rights. So deciding on the timing of the disclosure and the attribution, I would say that the new site has, uh, is in a difficult position and that she has a good copyright infringement claim against the new site as well. The solution to all of this is to put it in writing. Now, don't just rely on verbal agreements for your freelancer consulting work. You should have something signed by both parties. You don't need it notarized or anything further, just uh, one simple agreement laying out not just the IP issues, but the scope of work more generally, which you, you probably are, are doing anyway. Um, but <clears throat> the agreement definitely needs to have some IP clause in there. So a general assignment, if the hiring party wants to own the copyright, the economic rights outright, this would be done through an assignment. Um, but it can't just say you have to assign all of the rights. That would be a general assignment. The, co the copyright law says that it has to specify and properly limit as to the coverage of the rights, the place. So geographically, is it just limited Cambodia worldwide or something in between? the objectives of the use and the duration. 
Um, and then do not forget that the photographer retains those moral rights. So uh, be sure to, for instance, give attribution. Another solution, part of the solution is to deposit the work with the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts. Um, now, as I said before, copyright protection is automatic. The time of creation, the copyright uh, exists. There's nothing further needs to be done. This is an option um, to register or deposit your work with the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts, and they will issue a certificate and says you are the presumptive owner of the copyright in this. So if it's an issue, uh, this is recommended for particularly valuable works. If you're creating a film, for instance, or if uh, you think that there's some complication as the ownership, you can go and, and register your uh, deposit, your work and receive a registration certificate. Um, a final little point is that for computer programming, this entire problem of the freelance photographer uh, it has been solved. In Article 22, um, it says that if uh, someone has created a computer program by virtue of a purchasing contract, so a labor contract, they're not an employee, um, then the person who purchased that that program is entitled to the economic rights. There are different rules for films and broadcasts and performances um, and so forth. And I, I can't say anything more than copyright law. It can be complex. It's not in every situation, um, but there are these, uh, these little loopholes or complications or different rules for different kinds of works. And at the end, I'll show you some resources where you can get further information. But I just hope that you have some general awareness of how these issues work. And finally, another level of complication is the foreign dimension because Cambodia is obviously part of uh, a much broader world. And this is dealt with through what's called the Berne Convention. It's an international agreement uh, that has just come into effect in Cambodia which means that Cambodian works are automatically protected abroad and vice versa. So foreign works are automatically protected in Cambodia. That wasn't the case beforehand. Now, in, when you're dealing with the internet and online infringement, you can have copyright laws of many countries that could apply. And I can't go, we did a webinar a few weeks ago about this, which I believe you still have, you can have access to through, through, through the IPSME help desk, um, the copyright law can be complex. There is more information on their website. Uh, here on the right, you have uh, a very helpful infographic about um, the Berne Convention. But basically everything abroad is, is now protecting Cambodia and everything that Cambodians make will be protected abroad. <clears throat> In closing, I have a few practical tips of what to do. So you can mark your uh, works with the Circle C, you just use that uh, symbol and then followed by your name and you are claiming copyright um, or informing the world that you are the copyright owner. If you have a trademark, um, you should always use the circle R or the TM next to it. You can also use uh, tools to put a digital watermark on your uh, photograph or your text. Uh, it's invisible at first sight, but it allows you to trace that this was indeed your work um, and provide some legal evidence. You can also, as I spoke about, deposit your work with the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts. Um, teach your staff and freelancers about copyright. So tell them, um, so if you, for instance, have a team of uh, programmers, um, make them aware that the code that they're using is copyrighted and what a license is. And if you're hiring freelancers, talk to them about the copyright issues of the work that they are um, passing on to you, that you are hiring them to, to make. And finally, in bold, written agreements. I hope that uh, that has come through loud and clear. Finally, a word about enforcement, because everything I was talking about is just a matter of who owns the rights. But then once that person has those rights, what do you do against about it if someone is, you think, infringing them? Nothing happens by itself. 
uh, it's up to you to enforce your rights. And there's lots of copyright infringement going on, but if the copyright owner doesn't do anything, then it just gets away and it happens. Uh, the first step would be to collect the evidence. So taking screenshots, uh, if you, you might have an interview with someone who's witnessed the infringement, collecting all of that evidence in writing um, and saved in a safe place if uh, it comes to a dispute. Then you should decide on what exactly it is you want. Do you want them to simply stop copyright infringement? Do you want them to continue but just give you attribution? or a little bit of money or a lot of money? Uh, do you want money for what they were doing in the past or continuing for the future? Um, do you want to involve uh, the government um, and criminal prosecution? And then the first step is to approach the other party. And this really depends on the context of the relationship and the infringement. I mean, if it's, it can be anything from a very friendly conversation with the uh, the party that's hired you and you say, look, I saw you're using my photograph uh, on these other sites. Um, maybe we should talk about copyright to anything. Um, if it's just an outright counterfeiter stealing your work and profiting off of it, then the first could be just a, a cease and desist letter from yourself or from a, an attorney uh, really threatening them. So anything in between could be, could be possible as well. And you try to negotiate and convince them in really settling this outside of court is the, the way to go, but it can't, it doesn't always happen. Um, and you need to be prepared to, to really assert your rights if it's, if the matter is important enough to you. Um, you also have the ability to go to mediation or arbitration. So I have a third party involved in, in adjudicating this matter. Um, and if that doesn't solve it, you can go to court. Um, that uh, can get quite expensive, and but it's the last resort if none of this works. A final note about um, online infringement is there's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This is an American law that established a takedown process. So if you notice that your photograph is appearing on YouTube or Facebook or any major platform, they have an online system to just notify, uh, notify the platform owner, Facebook, um, of the infringement, and it will almost it goes for a, a short review and is almost always taken down. And then they notify the the person who's infringement. But this is a very practical way for you to to get some meaningful result with basically no cost. Um, I spoke about the further resources on the left. We have the Complete Guide to Intellectual Property in Cambodia, which has a, a long chapter about copyright. Um, if you go to our website, we also have a blog and you subscribe to our newsletter to keep up to date on these. You have uh, lots of resources through the World Intellectual Property Organization and of course the IP Help Desk um, with their helpful fact sheet on Cambodia. Um, that brings me to the end of the formal part of the presentation and I'll hand it back to uh, our panelists and looking forward to, to their questions and anyone of uh, the participants in the webinar as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David. This was a very informative, insightful and packed with practical process. So our next will be the um, Q&A sessions, which will be moderated by um, Mr. Tang Zolan. Um, our public-private dialogue coordinator of Eurocham Cambodia. And also we would like to um, welcome uh, Mr. David Haskell again to the panel. Uh, Mr. Narat Chip, Eurocham board member, chairman of Eurocham HR committee and managing director of Ocean Consulting. Also, we would like to welcome Mr. Harrison White, CEO and founder of Cambodia Investment Review. Please welcome. Thank you, um, thank you, Atika. Thank you, David, for the um, very um, insightful presentation. I uh, have to say I have learned a lot from these uh, presentations. <laughs> um, so first question to you. We are discussing here the words consultant and freelancer. Is there any difference between the two terms? Yes and no. I mean, they're different words. I would say that it depends on the context that you're talking about. Um, so, you know, 
we often speak of a freelance journalist or a freelance photographer. Um, and that's someone who can write articles for different media outlets. Um, but we also talk about a management consultant and that actually can, you know, if you work as a management consultant for McKinsey, uh, you're an employee. What they're doing is consulting. Um, so those terms, uh, they overlap and they uh, are, it's a bit messy, but if we're talking about the law, uh, when speaking about the law in Cambodia, it's the same. And the law doesn't even mention those two types. Um, they just speak about a labor contractor. And that's someone who's basically not an employee. So an employee is someone who, is, as I said, receives a salary, is under the direction and control of the employer. Um, whereas uh, a labor contractor, freelancer, consultant is taken on to do a specific project or specific tasks for a set uh, period of time um, and that they are on their own to go and do it. Uh, they should not be working from the same premises as an employee. Um, they should not be using the employer's computers. Um, and a lot of companies get into trouble by pretending that uh, the people that they work with contract says it's a labor contractor, you're not an employee, but the labor court would look at the totality of the circumstances. So if you have your employees sitting right next to your consultants and they're doing the same work, they're interchangeable, they're using the same computers, they're uh, there for the same periods of time, you expect them to show up at nine, leave at five o'clock, uh, <clears throat> it's very likely that the court would basically ignore what you put into the contract saying that they're a, a labor contractor and treat them as employees. Okay, uh, thank you. So from the legal point of view, um, consultant and freelancer are more or less uh, uh, the same, right? Um, sure. Thank you. Could you tell us more about the current practice of uh, IP protection for consultant and freelancer in Cambodia? Yeah, this is a great topic. I mean, I think from my research, this is this webinar is the first real uh, treatment of the topic. I don't have any found any surveys or real in-depth reports about it, but obviously there's lots of freelancers and consultants on this call. Um, so they have lots of experience in knowing how it's working in practice. But just based on my knowledge and sense of talking with clients, I think that the current practice is quite basic. I think in most cases, IP is never really a topic that's being uh, discussed between the parties. Um, at most, there might be a, a boilerplate clause in the, in the freelance or a consulting contract that says something about IP, but most parties probably didn't read it or didn't quite understand it. Um, and so I don't think it's something that both, neither party really thinks about until there's an issue. Um, so I'd, I'd be happy to hear their views of any freelancers and their personal experience, but uh, hopefully this webinar has, has raised the awareness and knowledge of, of the topic. Okay, David. So let's hear from uh, other panelists also. Bong uh, Rat first uh, asked you from the consulting firm, mainly in the um, HR field. How do you see the importance of IP protection for HR consulting firms such as uh, yours? Okay, uh, thank you Zola for the question and uh, hello everyone for joining this uh, webinar. So uh, it is really important to answer to your question uh, to, to know about uh, the IP right, especially the copyright for people who work uh, for the consulting firm. And I think uh, David have already shared a great deal of, uh, of what is, uh, how, how important is it and, and why we should know. I think as, um, as uh, what I observe uh, personally and what I see as uh, in the practice, more often than consultant or freelancing or in a consulting and, uh, company in general, uh, sometimes we use the verbal agreement as, uh, as David had said, and we didn't put uh, everything into writing. And this can create um, a lot of complication as, uh, as we have seen uh, earlier from, from what David have shared. So I think um, 
as as um, a good practice that uh, that I used to uh, to see is that um, when we involve in this kind of uh, situation or scenario, uh, it's better to uh, to have everything clear and put in writing. And I think uh, before talking about uh, going into a very uh, you know full scale legal protection, you know with the with the with the relevant institution, I think the um, HR department or sometimes HR legal, legal department in the company play a very important role because, you know, as simple as uh, having a clear employment contract, if we talk uh, about employment contract, or it's about uh, freelancing or consultancy contract, in that case, uh, we have to uh, make it clear uh, on what uh, should be the right, uh, you know, who to retain the ownership, uh, economic rights and moral rights and so on. And I think this has solved a lot of problem or wrong expectations in the beginning without, you know, realizing it later and, uh, and cause, uh, you know, conflict or, or, or trouble in dealing with it at the end. So I think uh, we talk about uh, putting uh, things clearly into, uh, into the agreement uh, before starting the work. And I think, uh, I think we, we talk about non-disclosure agreement, if I understand it well, I think this play important part also to uh, to have it uh, mentioned clearly uh, so that you know uh, as a freelancer or consultant or as a company who are employing them uh, we have come to agreement and we discuss uh, a great deal about it on what should be uh, uh, done and who should retain the, the economic right and so on so by by doing this i think it's avoid uh, the problems in the beginning and I think one uh, one other important area where HR consulting firm and uh, and um, HR uh, uh, practitioner in the company can uh, can help is to provide training uh, for staff you know uh, who have um, uh, involved in this kind of, uh, of situation. I think uh, it's it's a great job for them to to understand uh, what is the right way to do, what is the right. Uh, you know, an obligation of people uh, in this uh, in this um, situation. So I think um, by doing this, it's uh, it's really uh, helpful. I think one one last thing that I noticed also, especially for company who are well established with the uh, you know well managed IT system, this can be done by uh, you know limiting access to information. So giving access only to those who are um, supposed to get information, and with those. Uh, uh, people, we have a, a clear written agreement on on what is the the, the right and uh, and ownership and so on. And for those who doesn't have access, simply uh, we restrict their access. So I think by doing this, uh, it helps a lot in uh, in uh, dealing and avoiding issues at all. So this is how how I see for for uh, current situation uh, that uh, I can observe in uh, in a consulting firm and for the uh, you know HR department in general. Thank you. Thank you, Bong. Um, just a short question. Would you consider applying for IP protection for your HR management uh, advice? Uh, very good question, uh, Zola. Actually, I uh, I think this uh, probably I will seek help from David uh, to, to give me uh, more advice on what, uh, what are important things to do. But uh, frankly speaking, uh, for the moment, uh, what I do uh, is to uh, you know have a clear written agreement uh, when it's possible uh, to avoid a conflict or, or misunderstanding later on. But uh, I think uh, I will uh, remain open to see if there is any important work or you know uh, uh, situation where I have to seek a more you know serious protection. Thank, Thank you, you Nara. If I can jump in, um, a few comments. Uh, your question, Zola, is great. Um, I hope I made clear that. Your the HR management advice or report is automatically copyright protected. So there's nothing more that you need to do. You do not need to deposit it. And in most cases, depositing that kind of uh, work report is, is, is very uncommon. So you are protected under copyright. Um, you can make that very clear in the report itself that this is a copyrighted work. Um, you can put limitations on the recipient's uh, use of it. Um, you can really emphasize that this uh, is not to be modified or distributed um, without your expressed permission. And secondly, Narat, you mentioned very well uh, non-disclosure agreements and trade secrets and confidential information, uh, because this is also this is another big area of IP that, as I mentioned, Cambodia does not have a trade secret law. 
Um, so this can be still protected as a part of a contract and kind of implied within other parts of, let's say, the employment contract. Um, but if you're not uh, teaching your staff about um, the importance of trade secrets and what information they can send outside and what needs to be uh, maintained and not copied, uh, then you're going to lose those trade secrets. And those are probably the most valuable part of what uh, you as a business have. Um, it's your, your basically your secret knowledge, what prevents your competitors from doing exactly what you're doing. Thanks for David. Okay, thank you. Uh, before moving on, just um, a reminder to to audience that um, if you have any questions, please use it. Um, please put it in the Q and A um, box of the uh, Zoom. So um, let's hear from the media sector also. Um, Harrison, uh, similar question. What is your thoughts on the importance of IP protections for the um, the um, media or press sector? Yeah, thanks, Zola. Um, and thanks, David, for a very uh, great explanation of quite a complex subject. Um, now, the, the importance of IP in the media sector, uh, it should be very important. Uh, in Cambodia, I think, like, in terms of what we're doing here, it's obviously still, still developing. Um, so I think it's very important that we have these conversations to understand more about what the laws really are. Um, from my experience of working in the media, as well as doing a lot of consultancy for third parties and having consultants work for me, um, we are just beginning to put these uh, these best practices into play. Um, I've been a little bit more cautious over the past year or so um, with any contracts we have now that we ensure we do have these specified um, IP agreements. Prior to that, um, signing a few contracts with people, myself, um, it was always very, very great about what those details were. Um, but I think most importantly, what people would like to know about is what are the enforcement uh, levels that people can actually follow up on. So, for example, if you're coming across and you see your article has clearly been lifted, uh, quotes have clearly been used, photos have clearly been used, what avenues do you really have to put pressure on people to um, actually remove those? At the moment, to be honest, it's more of a reputational um, enforcement is how I would come across and say uh, the fact that people know you're taking other people's work from a reputational point of view is what people are more concerned about. Whether or not actually someone's going to go down the path of hiring a lawyer, going to the Cambodian courts for a used photograph, I don't know if anyone's going to really want to go through that process. Um, of course, if we're talking high-level software, high-level trade secrets, I get that. But in terms of the media and what, what we're about, uh, reputation is actually more of a, a, a way to enforce what you're trying to do. Okay, that's um, interesting, Harrison. Um, and I have a question to you. Do you check um, intellectual property or IP when um, writing an article or using a photo? I think it's the answer could be yes, but uh, more like how you check for IP. Yeah, I think in terms of, um, you know, when you're trying to run a business, when you're trying to get things out fast, uh, you do have to sort of have a bit of a trust in what people are providing to you. Um, we do have a bit of a, you can sort of just sort of gauge onto it. Of course, when things are posted publicly on a platform, such as Facebook, for example, we, we sort of know what the barrier we can use those or we can't. Um, we understand when a government ministry, for example, provides us information or photographs, we know we can use those because they've, in, they've invited us. Where it gets a little bit more gray is when you start doing internet searches and things pop up and you might think it's from a source where you can use however they've actually taken it from someone else without permission so you can almost sort of be involved in um breaching these these laws i guess for lack of a better word um without actually knowing it um so that's also where i feel very great is if i take someone's work but they've told me it's okay but if they take it from someone else and they haven't where does the, where does the liability the liability end um so these are things that we're looking more into Again, Cambodia is still very much developing in terms of these laws and understandings and cultural norms. Um, so forums like this today is fantastic to get a platform from where to jump off on. 
Thank you. So um, I have some more question on copyright, but um, before moving on to that, let me um, take one question from our audience. Um, Wolfgang Wies uh, asks, in a training course compiled by myself as a trainer, can I use a YouTube video which I link from um, internet? I think the question is more to um, David. Yeah, thank you, Wolfgang. That's a great question. <clears throat> because um, that video is certainly copyrighted, right? Um, when the owner of that video, the owner of the copyright uploads it to YouTube, they're providing a license. Um, so permission for YouTube to thereafter distribute it. Now, I don't know, I haven't read through those probably 50 pages of uh, user agreement from YouTube, but I would presume that it also allows the, the copyright owners also giving permission to other people, um, so to users to um, show that in, like you said, like a training course. So um, <clears throat> the users can play YouTube uh, videos, not just on their personal device, um, but also to a broader audience. Um, now, how broad that audience could be, I mean, if you rented a movie theater and you were showing YouTube videos, um, you might be breaching that license agreement, um, but I'm not so sure. I mean, in the end, YouTube is being financed by eyeballs, by clicks, um, and so in a way, the advertisers who support it are happy that more people are watching it, even if it's just one view and there are 10 people sitting in front of it. So I think you're pretty clear on the, uh, the use, of, um, use of YouTube videos in a training course. Um, but again, it's, this is where copyright law can be complex and a lot of it has to do with those user agreements. Um, thank, thank, oh. Great question, Wolfgang. Okay, David, um, you spoke about recording a copyright, but I thought protection was um, automatic. Can you explain what recordal is and how you do it? Yes, so it uh, it is indeed automatic. The second you write something or take a picture, it's copyright protected. The deposit scheme um, is an optional thing that you can do that the owner of the author, the owner of the copyright can, uh, go down to the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts. Um, they need to bring a copy of the work. So it could be on a CD or it can be a printout. Um, there's a form that you need to fill out saying, what is the work? How, how, do you, how are you the owner of it? And there's a fee to be paid. I think it's, I think it's less than $100. And the Copyright Office will um, examine that. And if everything is in order, they will issue uh, you a certificate. Um, and besides just being a piece of paper, it's basically a presumption that you own the copyright if it ever came to a dispute. So my there, <clears throat> most works are not being deposited because there's millions, billions of uh, every email or selfie someone takes is being is copyright protected. So it's very uh, unusual that anything is being um, deposited. But if it's a very important work to you or you have some dispute about the ownership, I would recommend doing that. Okay, we are discussing the uh, protection part here. Let's go to infringement part also. If someone infringe my copyright, um, David, what sort of compensation could I expect? Mm. <clears throat> so the compensation, the general idea is that the court would put you in a position um, as good as you were if the infringement didn't happen. And that really means that there's two things that they could look to. Um, they could look to what a reasonable licensing fee. So if you had negotiated before the infringement happened about um, the price of either transferring the copyright or licensing them, um, then you can try to get a, a figure, a monetary figure through that or um, what they call disgorgement of profits. So if someone 
has infringed and is selling your work, all that profit that they made um, should go to you as the copyright owner. Um, but frankly, these are very nebulous uh, frameworks and difficult to prove. Um, if it really did come to a dispute, you have the lawyer's fees and the court fees and the amounts in a best case scenario will cover that amount. But um, it's at some point uh, you do need to take a stand. I mean, if I can reply to Harrison made a number of very good comments about enforcement and what can he do when he sees someone uh, infringing his, his uh, copyright. Now, I mentioned the, the DMCA takedown notice. So if uh, articles that appear on um, your website are showing up on Facebook without uh, your permission, that's a very easy copyright takedown notice. Um, but if it's not on Facebook or another big platform, you might have to go against the infringer themselves. And when it's just one individual photograph or one article, um, it's not going to be worth your time more than please take it down, which in the case of uh, determined copyright infringers who, who know what they're doing, uh, they're just going to ignore. But if there's a competitor who's really using your content um, as their business model um, and regularly has created like basically an alternate um, website a media channel using your content or maybe the content of others, then you really do need to go after them. And it can be kind of a whack-a-mole process where you take them down once and then they show up on with another server, but it's uh, nothing happens automatically. You really need to defend your IP and, and otherwise it can gradually erode your business model. But like you said, it's the reputation. So if the consumers, the readers don't uh, trust those other sources, then the work, the, the viewership should stay with you. I can jump in there just for a second. I think yeah, that's please. a very good, yeah, that's a very interesting one. The, the number of mirror sites I'm seeing popping up a lot now um, with literally they just, whatever you've posted on your website is just, just mirrored on another one. When you try and follow up where they are, they're not even based in Cambodia. They're in different locations around the world or servers aren't in. My server even isn't based in Cambodia, Singapore. Like, so these things, they're, they're multinational. Um, and from what we're talking about, the, the practicality of going after these, these sources just really isn't, in my opinion, is not going not gonna to happen. So you need to think about alternative enforcement ways. That's why I love what you said, David, about trust. So if you, you, you need to be the authority figure on your work. Um, and you need to put an embarrassment onto the other people who, who do try and take it. And I really think you, you need to think along those lines. Um, going to court really would be, I don't even think an option for 99% of the cases. So we, we, as a community, we need to think about different different avenues of what we can take. Yeah, very good point. And this inter intersects with, <clears throat> so when you're talking about reputation and your name, this is brand, this is the area of trademarks, this is the protection of your URL. Um, and so this is, you can protect your business model through several areas of IP. Um, and if people really trust your brand and your name, then maybe that's the way that you need to protect it more than the copyright. Yep. Okay. Um, I have one question to um, Harrison. Sin, um, you are writing many articles, um, publishing it also. Um, have you filed any um, complaints again? Um, IP infringements. You mean personally, or do you mean outside other people? I mean um, to to um, to <coughs> any media, any anyone using your article. Um. Um, you know, to be honest, it's one of those things where it's the industry it, we are in. People are going to be using other people's uh, comments or photos or quotes or um, you know, it's as or even sometimes many of the cases, literally just taking the article and reposting it onto their own website. Um, I've had experiences where I'll send someone an email and say, oh, by the way, uh, can you provide some sort of assistance for us as a backlink, for example, or things like this. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but as David said, I think that the first point of, of contact, at least trying to find out how, who to speak to, 
Um, we have a, there's a couple of sites who are based, I think, in India, um, who literally just take the articles and repost them uh, verbatim. Things like that, you try and contact, there's no response. I really don't know what more to do. That would be examples internationally that we, we've had experience with. When I'm working for third parties as a consultant ourselves, so we help out with reports, this is where all you can, can really control is what, is what you're doing. That's why I did at the start of the webinar say what was interesting is how can I verify when someone gives me content and says it's free to use and original, how can I believe them? That's the one thing I find hard, having to actually verify what they're sending me. They, they've really got the permission to send to me. Um, things like this, we don't want to be caught out. So having to do those extra miles and double checking things and even as simple as sometimes just, you know, control C, control V into Google and just seeing where they got it from. Um, actually, as believe it or not, it's more, uh, it works more, more times than you think it would. Um, so little tricks like this um, when you're operating in a market such as we're in uh, are really important to you know. Okay, David, um, uh, Harrison, sorry. Um, uh, one question from our audience, um, Chon Song Ming asks, uh, would you be able to talk more about the uh, enforcement of software pirating? How could a foreign software developer enforce its right against um, pirate software user in Cambodia? Um, yeah, David, <clears throat> great, great question, because obviously there's, there can be lots of and software pirating, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I mean, look, the the copy the software is copyrighted um, by the the foreign the Microsoft or whoever is distributing that copyright, um, and so the legal framework is they would need to file a court case in Cambodia against the infringer. Now that is uh, on a an individual level, uh, very unlikely. Um, Microsoft does go against bigger distributors of uh, unlicensed software um, from time to time in, in markets, um, but it's it's kind of a whack of a, a mole problem because if these companies are, you know, they're they're pirates, uh, they know that what they're doing is illegal and they're willing to take the risk. Um, so a lot of the protection that they do is through technical pr protection measures. So <clears throat> they will. Um, when you install a copy of Microsoft uh, Office, uh, you need to input the key. And that will uh, automatically sync with uh, Microsoft's servers and they can verify it that way. Um, so it's, it's a lot of technical protection measures that happen in the background. Um, but then the pri pirates are good at finding ways around that. So it's, it's a constant uh, fight against back and forth. Thank you, David. I, I think uh, we have, uh, it's a very interesting uh, discussion, uh, but we have reached the um, time limits. So I will um, end this, uh, this um, Q&A session with um, final question to uh, David. David, what are the key uh, takeaway from this webinar? Three main points, preferably, could be more, of course. Thanks. Um, so the first is to just be aware of IP in the work you produce. So the IP, the inbound copyright and the outbound, like I talked about. What works are you using in your work that are copyrighted? Do you have permission? And then who owns the copyright and what you produced? Secondly, so clarifying the IP rights in writing before you start working. Um, because once it's done, then you're in a very different negotiation strategy uh, standpoint. And third is to stand up for yourself if your rights are infringed. Um, and I, I realize that there's no easy solutions in a lot of situations, but if it is important enough to you, um, then you need to, to enforce this or bring this to the attention of the infringer because it's not going to happen without you. So with that, I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed the webinar and has some additional awareness of IP issues as a freelancer consultant. Uh, you're free to send me an email um, or uh, look to the IP SME help desk resources uh, to learn more. Um, thank you very much uh, for the organizers and, and to all the participants for this time. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> thank you, David. Um, the fourth one, if I may, uh, from your presentation, of course, um, deporting, 
depositing your works with the Ministry of Cultures and Fine Art is also um, an, op an option you can see to, um, to protect your, your works. So um, thank you, um, Patika. I think that's the end of the Q&A session. Thank you so much for, to our moderator and our panelists and speakers for the Q&A sessions. It was very insightful and full of knowledge. So in our last section, um, we will come to an end. But before we ending, I would like to invite Mr. Denis Santmarie, I'm your Cham Executive Director, to give the closing remark. Thank you very much. Just a few words for closing our today's session to thank our today's speaker for having shared their insight and perspective on IPR risk and opportunities for freelancer and consultant. I believe that our today's speaker and panelists have covered the topic both in a practical manner and in a comprehensive way. I want also to thank your Ocham colleagues for having identified the today topic as I'm convinced that it is very relevant to current practices and um, trends in the business community. Uh, the webinar was made possible thanks to the support and expertise provided by the Department of Intellectual Property of the Ministry of Commerce, thus, uh, the, or today, uh, part, uh, partner, um, speaker, sorry, sorry, and the Southeast Asia IPR SME Help Desk. Uh, let me take this opportunity to commend the support provided to us and also to individual European companies by this European funded Southeast Asia. IP SME Help Desk over the past four years. This entity is based in Ho Chi Minh City. Many thanks to all the today participants, and I hope to meet all of you during upcoming online or in person Eurocham Cambodia initiative. Thank you very much for today. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Denis. So I'll come to an end. So once again, we would like to. Thank you to all the participants, all moderators, all the moderators and speakers for joining this webinar. And I would we would like to say thank you to Southeast Asia at Yasin Kalpes for their collaboration with Yuri Um Also, um, if any of you in this um, webinar are not yet a member of Yuri Chem, please feel free to do so. Our contact person will be Ms. Monica Chai. Um, also, we will have two upcoming events. One will be the breakfast talk on seniority and back pay. This will happen um, hybridly. One is uh, at Sovetel of Phnom Penh Kukhetra and one uh, via Zoom. And the other one, we will have our first ever healthcare networking night um, on the 28th of July as well. The location is yet to be confirmed. And if you have any more questions, you feel free to contact Ms. Din Udama or me myself would be um, in for your assistance in all the upcoming events. So uh, we would like to also take this opportunity to welcome our new members who just freshly joined us. Thank you for your trusting, for your support in Eurochem. And once again, we would like to also thank, thank you to our annual partners in this year for an, their ongoing support. So this webinar has come to an end. Thank you once again for your participation. and wish you a very um, uh, good evening. Thank you. <laughs>